pleasure and my duty to introduce <laughs> to introduce my no, mate no Yoko Okama. Uh, we worked together at RMIT, uh, which was a really fruitful and delightful working and personal relationship. Um, Yoko is associate professor uh, in the School of Design at RMIT. Her background is in communications design. She told me not to read her bio. She specifically said, don't use the bio graph, <laughs> there was a graph involved. But I will tell you that she won a Good Design Australia Award in both 2014 and 2018. So she is... Um, Te teamwork. Certainly yeah, helping quite just, just one of many. Yeah. Anyway, three interesting things though, that I can tell you about Yoko, which aren't on the bio. She has a dog <laughs> called Bento. These yeah. are the important things. Her background is in communication design, and she is still in communication design. And she recently was struck down with an awful case of vestibular vertigo, mm -hmm. which the, the, the remedy for which involved holding herself upside down at a precise 45 degree angle. Eppley yeah. maneuver. Eppley maneuver, yeah. yes. Yeah. So yeah. with that in mind, Yoko staying on ahead of 45 degrees, I give you Yoko Pa. Thank you. Thanks, Auntie. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to darken this yeah. room. Uh, great. Um, excellent. Hello, I'm Yoko. Um, sorry, this, it's hard to, I'm going to stand here. Sorry, there's a bit of a barrier. Um, but thank you, Shanti, for your um, very humorous and lovely introduction. And thank you also for Laura for... Uh, inviting me to this uh, amazing conference, and um, and I've only been to um, one session this morning, but it's been really um, intriguing and uh, thought-provoking discussions. Um, I'm a design educator and researcher um, in the School of Design at RMIT School of Design. It's a bit of a new thing for us. It's only been two years in the running. Jules has seen the audience been a bit of a rocky ride, but I think it's going really well. I was born in Japan, but I've been living and working uh, in Melbourne on East Kulin land since 2001. I'd like to pay my respect to Kulin ancestors and elders past, current and emerging, and recognise the strength, resilience and capacity of all Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the members of their community here today. I'd also like to thank uh, Nawit Carolyn Biggs, uh, Briggs for her welcome, her very powerful welcome, and her welcome to state your purpose. So stating your purpose, to me, is an obligation to bring your whole self to a sovereign encounter, to have a respectful, sovereign relationship. Who's your mom, as what Brian asked, is a question that calls for you, for your entire relationality. So your ancestry, your family, places where you're from, uh, to that encounter to build that relationship. So as a Japanese woman, um, being respectful of hosts, elders, and sacred places is a familiar but also important cultural practice that I bring to this sovereign encounter. Let me show you a river of, uh, sorry, let me show you a video of a sunrise taken on New Year's this year. This river, called Furutonegawa, runs a few blocks behind our house in Japan. Attending the sunrise is a ritual that many Japanese undertake, stemming from an ancient Shinto practice of worshipping the sun and nature. You can't see it in this frame, but many of our neighbours are behind us. We repeat the same ritual year after year. New Year 2019 was a crisp, clear and cold morning, as you can see and we watched the sun creep over the houses. We also, so also saw Mount Fuji, which is very auspicious and good luck, and you can only see it on a very clear morning. I am the only daughter of Akama Chiaki and Kinoe. This is their wedding in 1968, dressed in traditional kimono. Kinoe is in a crimson red kimono with white cranes, and Chiaki is in black and grey hakama. Chiaki, my dad, grew up on a farm in rural Hokkaido, 
in North, um, North Island of Japan. The youngest of 13 children, born just when the Pacific War started, and the only one who went to university, carrying with him financial investment and hopes of his, his entire family to take them out of poverty. So I can never do this without getting upset. He studied economics, taught himself English, and was employed by the third largest multinational trading company. So our family migrated with him to different cities and countries around the world. He was what you call a typical salarima, an army of workers who shouldered the burden of rebuilding post-war Japan through a lifetime of dedication to their companies. Last month marked two years since his passing. Sorry. And the times I fondly remember from my childhood is his delight of helping me with my schoolwork and how, how I was his clever little daughter who could speak perfect English. From him, I learnt about loyalty, respect, discipline, and the value of education. Kinue, my mother, was born in Manchuria, China, when my gran grandfather, a soldier of the Japanese army, was stationed there. Every August, when Japan marks the end of the Pacific War, my mother weeps with shame and compassion. And I carry these emotions within me. The past, for many of us, is very much alive. Typical of most Japanese women at the time, my mother served her husband and the family. She didn't go to university, <coughs> but went to finishing school to learn domestic science. She is a proud housekeeper, the most amazing cook, incredibly thrifty, sociable, and creative. She made my clothes and my toys and taught me how to sew, cook, and care for things. <clears throat> From her, I've learned about creativity, imagination, and empathy. Global forces and world histories have shaped our family just as it has yours. I am a product of this world's continual becoming. Forty-three years later, at our wedding, compared to the time when my parents married, my kimono and hair ornaments have become far elaborate. It's actually a little bit too bling for my liking. <laughs> Dion, my husband, is wearing a hakama also, which is pretty much the same, but it has a bigger pom-pom. I'm not really sure what that means. Because of my family circumstances, I grew up in various countries, including Japan, Australia, and the UK, with a heightened sensitivity to cultural plurality, anchored by my family, that gave me a sense of belonging in the various places where we lived. But I also struggled with a Japanese stereotype, both overseas and in Japan, who is expected to behave quoting an American-Japanese writer, Mitsuo Yamada, the submissive, subservient, ready to please, easy to get along with Asian woman. My friends in the audience know that I'm not that. This othering by strangers ranges from stereotyping, naive racism, to curious exoticism, which continues even now. This is my grandmother, seated in the middle, surrounded by my great aunties. She stitched kimono for all her four children. I am wearing this kimono that's been passed down from her, down to me, through many women in my family, and I feel empowered by their love and strength, but I also fear and feel the gaze of being othered. It is a productive tension that I hope to bring to this talk. So even what you might hear or experience in my talk today might sound strange or familiar to you. 
I'd like to invite you to locate your own posi positionalities of your knowing, being, and worlding, so we may explore mutual divergence and resonance to accommodate many worldviews in this current state of global politics that is rejecting differences in extreme ways. And instead, pursue ways to embrace polycentricities as a necessary generosity because we are already entangled and implicated with one another. We are all products of this world's continual becoming. The broader background of my talk comes from shared concerns that it's not humans as a species that are destroying the planet, but certain doctrines, institutions, systems, and ways of relating that have become so dominant that as a consequence, eroded, displaced, or eradicated plural ways of being, knowing, and becoming with many. This echoes similar concerns shared by the Colombian anthropologist Arturo Escobar, who talks about the paradox of, of fixing modern problems with modern solutions, especially if these crises stem from modern world-making practices that have erased and subjugated divergent ontopistemologies and worldviews. So this is something that we heard Brian talk this morning and what uh, the undercurrent of some of the presentations that I heard today. The dominant form of design has accompanied this modern world-making practices by being useful, functional, durable, seductive, convenient. It is implicated in advancing ideologies of growth, control, progress, and fixing problems with solutions. The universalizing paradigm that values knowledge, process, and methods that can be abstracted, reproduced, and generalized is powerful because it aids the movement between time, culture, place, and people. When this pursuit of knowledge combines with design, it detaches knowledge from relationalities and sites of design's embodiment, further perpetuating the view of practitioners as culturally neutral, objective, interchangeable and ageographical. Deeper descriptions of their backgrounds, social cultural context, philosophy and values are rarely shared. This is cyclically fortifying a design culture of nowhere and nobody, likewise lamented by the seminal anthropologist Lucy Suchman. This necessitates the need to disclose how design is constituted by who we are, our relationality in the world, and how this manifests through our practices when we design with people. Taken all together, my worry is how this dominant understanding of design institutionalizes and how we, that's us all here, can become implicated in this circularity and authority, especially in what is taught or omitted what is considered knowledge or dismissed, what is made visible and what is kept invisible. Our institutions, systems of qualification, validation of knowledge and structures of education can often be implicated to affirm and stabilize such power and politics of what John Law calls one world imaginaries, which is also at work in design. So as a design community, we must always ask, what politic, politics is at work that is preventing us from accepting and attending to other ways of being and knowing? This talk is one attempt to question this. When design is often envisioned to shape futures, as we heard, as we heard in the panel's discussion this morning, rather than looking ahead, I'd like to look around, quoting Anna Tsing, to pay attention to what design researchers Calderon Salazar and Guterres Barrero have called designs with other names in pockets of practices that have continued within industrialized and modern societies. Later in this talk, I'd like to introduce a methodology, in air quotes, that's being designed and shaped by various philosophies and ontologies as an example of embracing uncertainty and possibility to experience design with other names that have coexisted with a pulsation of becoming with many worlds.
switching gears for a moment, one reason why I've been invited to talk today is because of our co-authored book, Uncertainty and Possibility, with uh, Sarah and Shanti. So I have the book here somewhere, but it doesn't matter. Um, I owe its development to their generous friendship and our mutual curiosities, as well as the... Yeah, this one. It's just that it's a beautiful cover that Dion designed. Um, so it's on sale at Bloomsbury. <laughs> sure there's copies of it in the library. Um, so I owe its development to their generous friendship and our mutual curiosities, as well as the collabor collaborations we've undertaken with various facilitators and many participants in a series of events during 2013 to 2016 in the Design and Ethnography Futures Program. We had a book landing in December 2018 to hack the conventions of a book launch and invited people to enact the playful and participatory approach to create a library of possibilities. today is not so much a launch as a landing. We're trying to take the book, give it to a group of other people, ask them to cut it up, mash it up, mix it up, and create something new, create their own books of uncertainty and possibility out of it. It's set up at the beginning of this to give people an idea of how far they can break the rules and how much uncertainty they can push back towards the organizers. What do you make? What do you do? How do you, how do you tackle that? that problem. We are doing um, our book which is turning into a pop-up slash tree that has multiple layers so you can read it in different ways. The next stage after we bind it is to do a reading and highlight some of the keywords or points within the pages. Well, I guess this workshop is um, picking up in a sense from some of the workshops that took place um, through the making of the book and that the book describes and talks about, which are all different examples where people from different disciplines are thrown together um, into a condition of uncertainty, if you like, of kind of creative uncertainty. Some of the questions we're asking in the book are things that practitioners are facing in their own businesses. Um, in um, embarking on change, whether it's an organisational one, a societal one. We can actually think into a future that we can never really know. And how accepting that uncertainty should actually be at the centre of our thinking. So my hope is that a little bit of that has settled, maybe landed, and that some of what we'll see is a bit surprising or maybe stays open to the uncertainty of the original task. I would love to see things that um, I could never possibly have thought of myself and that um, could only have emerged from the circumstances that we've tried to create here. Excellent. Uh, so that was a bit of the footage from our book landing. It was really, really fun, but then there was a fire alarm and we had to evacuate. <laughs> but that's the nature of uncertainty, I guess. So in the book, we propose three concepts, disruption, surrender, and moving beyond, as a set of continuous and entangled currents that manifested in different ways th throughout our events and remained as the most accommodating in exploring uncertainty together. There's one chapter each that takes disruption, surrender, and moving beyond as a fulcrum drawn from our workshops and events to provide examples of a range of approaches that were developed and extended in different ways according to the facilitators, contexts, and participants. You're welcome to read the book at your leisure. 
So here I'll only uh, summarize the three concepts. To give you an idea and spend more time on discussing risk as a problematic notion that is often associated with uncertainty. We acknowledge disruptions, destructive and gen generative dimensions and saw it as a provocative strategy to surface contradictions or promoted frictions to reveal phenomena and agendas previously hidden from view. It often triggered a genuine surprise and reconfigured ways of being and knowing collaboratively. Surrender is a movement that molts sharp distinctions and dualistic categories towards intimacy and embrace incompleteness. It speaks of the effort required in change making that also means letting go of things like habit, control, expectations and entrenched ways of thinking. Moving beyond refers to a willingness to fall into and engage with a possibility beyond our scope of tangible knowing and feelings to explore what could be to immerse in emergence and chance to transform and become together among, among heterogeneity. Altogether, uncertainty involves a form of learning through unlearning, not by acquisition of new knowledge, but through questioning what we are already doing, claims to what we know, and voluntarily unseat one's own certainties to interrogate what is taken for granted. We see this as a form of readiness or rehearsal for ongoing change making to build our capacity to be fluid and fluent and avoid automated knee jerk reactions or seemingly defensive self preservation. As I explained earlier, design as a discipline carries entrenched legacies and particular worldviews, so it does take some courage to step out of our disciplinary orthodoxy accept doubts about what we think we know and to catalyze and provoke new forms of change making within our practices and also more importantly how can we explore this together with our peers partners and participants oh, it's a pretty full-on slide for us here as researchers in creative practice embracing uncertainty it is a rather obvious point to make According to the writer, designer, art critic, and architectural historian, Jane Rendell, there are many inter interdisciplinary endeavors that necessitate us to give up the safety of competence and specialism, and instead enter a terrain beset with fears of inability, lack of expertise, and the dangers of failure. The transformational experience of interdisciplinary work produces a potentially destabilizing engagement with ex existing power structures allowing the emergence of fragile forms of new and untested experience, knowledge and understanding. So in order to embrace uncertainty, we also reframe it from negative and risk averse interpretations because dominant societies and institutions have treated uncertainty as something that needs to be controlled or mitigated. Risk is historically situated in modernity beginning with the enlightenment of human progress and social order that believed it can be explained objectively, scientifically and rationally. Quoting the sociologist Deborah Lupton, that assumed that the social and natural works follows laws that may be measured, calculated and therefore predicted. Lupton suggests that the contemporary obsession with risk is a result of deconstruction of tradition and rapid technological and social change stemming from modern industrial society. We can see these ideas of risk enduring into the 21st century, where risk amplified, amplified, amplified by threats of climate change has been defined as a codified social construct linked to misfortune. In seeking out the impact of risk, Researchers might ask questions in ways that compel participants to frame their social experience in terms of risk and its mitigation and control. Judith Green, a professor of sociology and health, urges us to consider how far a framing of risk constrains our ability to understand or describe how people make sense of uncertainty in the world, suggesting that as a concept, it might limit our empirical understanding of social experience. 
the German sociologist Ulrich Beck describes the paralyzing nature of risk that is often framed as being beyond the control of an individual. Someone who depicts the world as risk will ultimately become incapable of action. The expansion and heightening of the intention of control ultimately ends up producing the opposite. This opens up the possibility of further interrogation of uncertainty as a related but different societal phenomenon that, to that of risk and associated feeling of fear and failures. We are living in challenging times with daily reminders of multiple existential crises all around the world. In these moments, it's tempting to seek a ut utopian future, as our modernist fathers have led us to believe, and design our way out by pinning hopes on a better future, in air quotes, to build an armor of denial and detachment to distance oneself from experience. Society's impatience for results, outcomes and desires for quick fixes and easy digest is eroding our ability to be resilient. Design is not innocent in promoting itself to offer solutions to complex problems. So whether we like it or not, we are tasked, sometimes pressured, to address these issues. And many of us are seeking new, in quotation marks, interdisciplinary ways to engage with this, with this ethically and carefully. So how can we disrupt and provoke ways to reorient our posture and frame? How do we surrender and discard what Francisco Varela calls the spacesuit, padded with habits and preconceptions that habitually distances oneself from one's experience? How do we age change-making without selectively attributing purposeful change as a result of our own human interventions to instead embrace serendipity and heterogeneous constituents that we are already entangled within? What do we need to do to, do to move beyond as a movement of incorporation rather than inscription, quoting Tim Ingold. From here, I'm going to depart from the book while remaining within the themes of uncertainty and call upon designs with other names in pockets of practices that have continued within industrialized and modern societies. Okay, so who's done meditation? Ah, good to see. So meditation is, in air quotes, methodology that's been designed over thousands of years by Buddhists as a method and strategy to short-circuit the mind, Oops, sorry, next slide. which can discriminate, analyze, and divide the world into objects so as to bring mind, body, spirit into holistic alignment. Meditation is designed as a way to attune to the visible and invisible forces of this world and to feel that we are constantly becoming with forever changing. Looked at the wisdom of such teachings, the Cartesian separation is an unfortunate legacy that pervades much of design and technology, a separation of human and nature, self and others, and ways of relating with more, more than human dimensions of this world. This goes some way to explain why mindfulness is often framed in functional terms and meditation is taken as a guarantee for, fine, for mindful outcomes. A great teacher and Zen philosopher, Thich Nhat Hanh, says, there are two ways to wash the dishes. The first is to wash the dishes in order to have clean dishes, and the second is to wash the dishes to wash the dishes. What he means in this humble and everyday act is a lesson about life. To have clean dishes is to be, he says, sucked away into the future and we are incapable of realizing the miracle of life. Focusing too much on outcomes can inhibit how to recognize the fact of living in the midst of life as it is lived, even in the most mundane act. Meditation and mindfulness are not the same thing, but they are, they are two sides of the same coin. It's the coupling of the two that matters. So when only the methodology is emphasized for its usefulness, like meditation techniques to reduce stress or enhance performance, or turn into commodities such as a meditation app, 
Mindfulness is made to fit into a different worldview that is outcome driven. Mindfulness from a Japanese worldview is to have an empty kokoro, to let go of all thoughts, emotions, fear, insecurity, attachments, towards practice being in interrelatedness. Kokoro is commonly translated into English as heart or heart and mind, but these are only approximations, not equivalents, because the English language has a tendency to separate constructs. A prominent scholar of Japanese philosophy, Thomas Kasulis, describes how a poet might compose a poem about the mist on the mountains. He says, the poet's kokoro resonates with the kokoro of the actual mountain mist and the kokoro of the Japanese words. Japanese haiku reflects the Shinto worldview of interrelatedness. He continues, the poet alone does not write a poem without the mountain mist, more precisely, the mountain mist, the Japanese words, and the poet write the poem together. If you're confused, that's completely okay, because mindfulness or interrelatedness is not something that could be understood by thinking, reading, or hearing about it. Instead of, of externalizing knowledge as a way to understand, a Japanese worldview emphasizes direct experience. Designs with other names in Japan owe its heritage to various practices and philosophies that have traveled from India, China, Korea, and arriving in Japan, evolving through their arts, theater, poetry, tea ceremony, ceramics, architecture, which then became descriptions and reflections rather than analysis of our embodiment and relationship with becoming worlds. So for the next three minutes, I'd like to ask for your participation in a sitting, silent meditation as a way to try contemplating and embodying this way of knowing, being, and becoming. I'd like to invite you to put away your laptop and phone, adjust your seating so you're comfortable, and your feet are like tree roots anchored to the floor. You can keep your eyes closed or half closed, and to bring your presence in the moment. I'd like you to attend to how and where you're sitting, next to whom. Feel the weight of your head, where your limbs are. Feel the solidness under your feet. Notice your breathing, hearing, heartbeat, and the sounds around you. Gradually, let your thoughts go. Let go of the worries carried into where you came from and where you might go next. Let go of emails, deadlines, presentations you might need to make, stress, who's saying what on social media. Let go of all thoughts, emotions, fear, insecurity, confusion, and attachments. As and when you feel your mind wandering, attend to your breathing as the most simple and everyday act of living.
cute. What we tried together just then is a way of being, knowing, learning, awakening, interrelating without separating the mind, body and spirit. I should emphasize the trying part. And by fusing this together to have a heightened awareness of relational sensitivity. This is not that far from what Karen Barad calls ontoepistemology, doing, thinking, being together, for the feminist theorists in the room. But I hope you've accompanied my talk long enough to know the politics at work when I explain it in this way for you, because the practice I share has ancestries with a different lineage preceding feminism. Having many parallels with European philosophies gives this polycentric richness. However, anonymous reviewers of my papers have insisted that I cite European and established th theories as a way to legitimize my arguments in a frame of reference that they and the readers of my paper would comprehend. And while their advice has mostly been helpful, I couldn't help but feel the power and politics at work going as far as saying that it echoes acts of colonial practice that can dominate and displace the unfamiliar with the familiar. So instead of names and theories that you might be familiar with, I have deliberately chose teachings from Buddhism and Zen and quotidian, ritual, quotidian rituals from my Japanese heritage, such as watching the sunrise together on New Year's Day. These are not theories with a capital T or philosophies with a capital P, but they are intimately woven into the social fabric, having endured through centuries to shape how we inhabit and always become with many worlds. Just so you know, these video clips, which I filmed in Japan and Australia, are from a personal project with my British friends, Anne Light and Simon Bowen, to explore the relationship between mindfulness and technology. Simon and I also ran a workshop in 2016 as part of the, of the Design and Ethnography Futures event to critique the instrumentality with which design and technology is approached in distancing from what surrounds us, severing our states of being present in the moment. We ran this in response to how switching off technology was a common act of resistance to their intrusiveness and distraction as the only way to be mindful. So we attempted to explore a middle ground to consider ways that technology could disrupt mindlessness to trigger, remind, or invite us towards being more mindful. From collaborations with Simon and Anne, the technology I explored were videos that I've been taking as traces of my own mindful moments to be emplaced and feel the rhythms of a pluriverse. These videos could be seen as ways to travel through them, to attune and encounter with what the Zen scholar Daisid Suzuki calls the pulsation of reality and the sensitivities of the small things of nature. I may not live in Japan anymore, but living in Australia for 16 years has not diminished the spirituality, reverence, and contemplation in my everyday. It ha in fact, it has become more pronounced by inhabiting a landscape and working alongside people that inspire awe and wonderment. This is a power and design that I am rediscovering and reanimating, one that lay dormant or peripheral due to my Western design education. Practicing mindfulness can catalyze transformation to be immersed in the ebb and flow of designing whilst being changed by it. When I am present in the moment, I am emplaced in this country and feel resonance and interrelatedness with the world through mind, body, spirit, soul, kokoro. I feel most open, receptive and sensitized to formless phenomena riffing off Thich Nhat Hanh, instead of isolating each wave, comparing them by its power, benefit, or beauty, let's surrender ourselves as part of an ocean, already participating in the world's continual becoming. Thank you.